Today, we're going to continue to think about and understand about eliminating poverty. You know, our, our ultimate goal is to eliminate poverty, not just alleviate poverty. There's a major difference between eliminating and alleviating poverty. And we're fortunate to have with us the General Secretary of the uh, Board of Church and Society, General Board of Church and Society, uh, Reverend Dr. Susan Henry Crow. Um, she has uh, just been a great leader within the United Methodist Church. For 22 years, uh, she served at Emory University as their chaplain and helped to provide leadership there. She's also been on our Judicial Council and was the president of the Judicial Council for four years, um, but served 16 years uh, on our Judicial Council. And we all know the Judicial Council because we're getting more and more familiar with the Judicial Council as you continue to ask for Bishop's decision of law. So uh, you can talk to Susan afterwards if you have time. Uh, she'll explain more about how the Judicial Council works. But what she's really here to talk about is poverty and how we can continue to work on eliminating poverty. The leadership that she provides at the General Board of Church and Society um, is making a huge difference. She's brought great energy, clarity, education, understanding for the work that we do as United Methodists around the world as we work for social justice. Susan, it's great to have you. Thank you for coming and being with us today. God bless you. Good morning. Bishop, thank you so much for this invitation. Uh, this is kind of the heart of the work of the Board of Church and Society, and so I am very delighted to get to spend a little uh, bit of time with you this morning. Uh, Bishop Scholl has been a wonderful friend to me and has been really supportive in the years that I have been at GBCS, and that is a great gift. <clears throat> Uh, it is also a pleasure for me today to have my uh, dear colleague with me, Rebecca Cole. If Rebecca would stand up. Rebecca is the director of organizing, and I am the one that gets to talk about the work. Rebecca is the one that does the work. So I thought that it was appropriate to have uh, the people are one of the people that do this kind of work uh, before us today. I have several words of congratulations for you. I understand that you uh, yesterday passed the resolution on segregation in New Jersey schools. Congratulations. Uh, <clears throat> these resolutions sometimes seem like they don't make so much difference, but in fact, they make a huge difference in the public uh, view and in our own commitments. So thank you for your work on that. I also understand that you have entered into two partnerships, one with Bishop Monday in Tanzania and one with Bishop Ortiz in Puerto Rico. I know both of those bishops and a little bit about both of those areas and what a great relationship you're about to engage in. So I'm a little bit jealous. So if you find yourself going to Tanzania or to Puerto Rico and have an open seat, you're welcome to invite me. <clears throat> the third thing is your bishop did something very brave. He, um, and it caused me a lot of trouble, and I was so thankful for it. He called several weeks ago and he said, could we have a set of faith and facts cards for our annual conference? Does anybody have them here? Yes. Uh, we rushed around to prepare faith and facts cards for your annual conference, and it was a great gift to us because one of our goals is to get those distributed throughout the church, and your bishop was number one in asking for them for the annual conference. So thank you, bishop. <clears throat> GBCS is located on Capitol Hill, but works all around the world. Here you see um, a few pictures of the, your United Methodist presence. In the middle, you see a sign. If you can just leave, just leave the slides up and we'll roll through them. I don't have to be seen, I think, so much. <laughs> um, 
there is the sign, and it reminded me when I saw your own slides just a few minutes ago of Morristown. And signs become very important symbols for helping recognize United Methodist identity. How many of you have been to the United Methodist building on Capitol Hill? Great. I hope that you will all come, and I hope that you will make your presence known when you can. The United Methodist Building stands right beside the Supreme Court. It predates the Supreme Court, um, and it is your presence and our work all around the world, but it is located on Capitol Hill. The work of GBCS is the work of reconciliation, which involves personal, social, and civic righteousness. Those are words right out of the Book of Discipline that we as United Methodists are engaged in personal, social, and civic righteousness. But as we work to eliminate poverty, there are challenges. The challenges and the problems are pretty overwhelming. Let us look at slide two. There are several things that I would call to your attention. In 2017, a two-bedroom rental house costs approximately $21.21 .21 per hour of labor. And this is one of the challenges and one of the problems that we have in eliminating poverty. There is a widening income and wealth disparity both in the United States and around the world where the rich get richer and the poor get poorer and increasing numbers of middle class move into areas of poorness and fewer people move into the uh, areas of wealth. And so the disparity between the widening income disparities between wealth and poverty is really great. Economic recovery that is sometimes talked about in the media is not shared by all. The economic recovery helps some people, but it leaves many, many people living in poverty or just above the poverty line. There has been a stagnation in the living wage since 2009. That's a long time, that's almost 10 years. And for 10 years, this stagnation in the minimum wage has been the same. So if it takes $21.21 .21 per hour to afford a two bedroom apartment, that is not even the average wage per hour of people in the United States. The average working wage is $16.38 per hour, and the federal minimum wage is $13.96, meaning that both of those jobs, either in the federal um, system or in an average wage, does not come to what it costs to rent a two-bedroom, non-luxurious apartment. There is also increasing dehumanization of workers, and poverty becomes stigmatizing, and we often punish the poor. Sometimes we begin to stigmatize people who live in poverty and think that they have done something wrong, that they have not worked as hard as they could, they have not cared for their resources as well as they could, and that it is their fault that they live in poverty. Mostly people do not want to live in poverty. People want to make a living and work hard and care for their families and make a contribution to the society. But it is incumbent both on the government and upon people of faith to help eliminate the causes of poverty. And joblessness is one of those um, contributions that does not 
help eliminate poverty. I want to tell you two stories about uh, annual conferences um, that are beginning to address poverty to help stir your imagination about ways that you as an annual conference or churches in a district might be able to begin to address some of the issues of poverty. Uh, Bishop Scholl's good friend, Bishop McKee, who is the Bishop of Dallas, was involved in a project called the Zip Code Project. Have any of you heard of this? Uh, they, the Methodist Church in one of the zip codes in Dallas started going into the schools to give backpacks to children that could not afford backpacks. Well, when they did that, they began to realize that the issues in those schools were far greater than they had imagined, and that the backpacks would help. It would give them backpacks and pencils and paper for the school year, but it did not begin to address all the issues that those children were living in, surrounded by all kinds of poverty. So the annual conference and the churches in that zip code began to put in place churches that would begin to look at the root causes of poverty in that zip code. That has now expanded to several zip codes in the, the uh, Dallas area, and churches are um, very much engaged in addressing the root causes of poverty. There is racism that is there. There are issues of uh, child care, single moms, children having nothing to do. What? How do they eat in the summertime when they're not getting lunches at school? And how the church is beginning to really get at the grassroots issues of poverty in the Dallas area. I have the great opportunity to meet many United Methodists around the world and um, in the area. Last week, there was a church from Indianapolis that came to visit. They wanted to see uh, the General Secretary of Religion and Race and see me so that we could tell them what we were doing on the elimination of racism and on justice issues. There were seven people that came from one church, and I am going to name this church. It is called Broadway United Methodist Church in Indianapolis. And they applied for a grant from the Lilly Foundation. The Lilly Foundation gave them a grant to figure out ways to disrupt racism. There were seven people in this group. A few of them uh, were members of the congregation, and a couple of others were what they identified as constituents of the church and the community. These people, along with about 50 other people, have been engaged in talking about racism and poverty and injustice in their community for one year. I was so impressed that I finally said, it's much more important for you to talk to me to tell me what you're doing than it is for me to tell you what I am doing. Uh, I knew that I was coming here, and I knew that I would be in some other places, and I thought, this is a remarkable church, and what you are doing to address profound issues of racism and poverty and injustice in Indianapolis is very, very important. I hope that some of you will go on their website and look at what they're doing, and if you want more information about the in-depth work, uh, I'm happy to share that with you, as I'm sure their pastor is as well. But why do these challenges and these problems exist? John Wesley, 250 years ago, said, one great reason why the rich in general have so little sympathy for the poor is because they so seldom visit them. Hence, it is that one part of the world does not know what the other suffers. One part of the world, we, do not know what the other part of the world suffers. And I would, again, congratulate you on reaching out to the areas of the world where there is great suffering, as in the case of Puerto Rico. But Wesley's quote 
reminds us that we are increasingly disconnected even in an increasingly connected world. We are disconnected from ourselves and from the people close to us in a world that in some ways appears to be highly connected. Each of us participates and many of us benefit from the same forces of globalization. We are greedy people. We don't want to be, but we are greedy. Clothes from the hands of women made in Bangladesh and their conditions are horrible. There is food that we eat from farmers and people not very far from here that work in poultry plants and the conditions under which they work are terrible and we benefit and pay not so much attention to how their lives are lived while we enjoy our chicken or our steak or our vegetables or our tomatoes. And somebody has worked very hard for what we enjoy. Smartphones, and I'm going to ask you to pull out your smartphone in just a minute, is dependent on child labor in the mines of Central Africa. I have had, I don't know how many cell phones over the years, and a child, probably in Central Africa, has helped make that phone. And we have to ask the question, when did we start valuing convenience over faithfulness? When did we start caring about ourselves more than we care about those who serve and work for us. There's a website, I don't want you to spend the whole day looking at this, but I would invite you if you would like to pull out your cell phone and go to a site called slaveryfootprint.org. There are 27 million slaves worldwide. And if we are wearing clothes today, if we have cell phones today, if we have shoes today, if we are wearing jeans today, somebody most likely has been in slave labor for us to benefit from those um, goods that we consume. When you go to the slaveryfootprint.org website, you probably need your iPad or your computer. I have done this exercise to see how many people have contributed to just what I might be using and wearing today. It makes me mindful of how convenient I want my life to be, how good I want to look and live in the world, and the price that many people have had to pay for just me today. So what is the role of the church? What can we do to turn this upside down? What can we do to eliminate poverty? First, we have to imagine a way to help shift the narrative of scarcity into one of embracing abundance. We live, and I know as United Methodists, we do this quite often, that we think there are not enough resources. Our church cannot stay open. We do not have enough money. But that is the, not the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel of Jesus Christ is that I have given you all that you need. I have given you all that you need. And we must rejoice and share in our abundance and not fret to death over the scarcity narrative that we set up. So we must imagine a different way. The second thing is we have to see those who struggle in poverty not as a problem. Those who struggle in poverty are not as a problem to be solved, but as Christ himself 
who is calling us to respond in love. Christ calls us to live in love with one another and not to treat those who live in poverty as a problem. Number three, we have to imagine an economy that works and honors the dignity and the work of all people. For those of you who like to read theology, there is a book that I read many years ago by Dorothy Zerla, who is a German theologian, and the title of the book is To Love and to Work. And in that book, Dr. Zerla talks about the goodness and the value of work. If some of you read what I sometimes write on the website, I intentionally use the word work. I do not often use the word professionalism or jobs or positions, but I use the word work because it is a word that needs to be valued and appreciated. I work for the church. I work for the gospel. And I am proud to do that because it is good work, and I hope and want that all people who engage in work have their lives and their work valued and appreciated and paid for. And then fourth, the role of the church is to proclaim and affirm the sacred worth of all persons, of women, of children, of youth, of men, to reject the premise of our economy that people and communities and our very creation is disposable. How many things will you throw away today? I can't see the tablecloths, actually. Are they cotton or are they paper? They're cotton. Um, that is good. It means that they can be used again. But there are so many things. Just think for a few hours how many things you will throw away. All the cell phones I've had, I have either thrown away and they have gone to a garbage heap in Venezuela and ruined the um, environment there. I throw away plastic bottles. I throw away clothes that are I don't like, and just think about all of the things that we think and find to be disposable. There are many in every day, and we must change our thinking that to eliminate poverty, that there are not things that are disposable, but people and goods really need to be cared for. So we proclaim and affirm the sacred worth of all people. It's been part of our DNA in the United Methodist Church, and the Methodist Church is a predecessor body in the social creed. One of the reasons that I was interested in accepting this job with the Board of Church and Society was I was a young pastor, and I had... Um, was serving in a text, two textile churches um, in Greenville, South Carolina, which in the 80s was the textile capital of the United States because there were more textile mills in Greenville than any other single place of, that, of its size. I had never known much about the work of people in textiles. And one day I went to visit one of my parishioners and he was standing in water like ankle deep, and I said, Mr. Smith, what are you doing And in this water? And he said, these are the conditions under which I work. And I thought, there is something very wrong, and I went back to my office, and I looked up the social creed, and there in the social creed was a very long statement about the United Methodist Church's commitment to working for people who labor. Uh, the Social Creed is of, two, of 1908, talks a lot about everything that I have said today and the importance of a living wage, the elimination of sweating shops, not having child labor, and paying women for their work. We come from a heritage that labor is to be valued and the people who are laborers are to be cared for. As the church right now, we are seeking to revise the social principles 
I will not go into all the joys of that, but uh, the revisions are on the website, and I would urge you to take a look and to comment on the areas that are important to you, particularly around the issues and the challenges of poverty and the ways that you're willing to commit. Cornel West said, <clears throat> as to the role of the church, justice is what love looks like in public. Justice is what love looks like in public. Many of us saw over the weekend the royal wedding, and we heard those words of uh, the bishop, presiding bishop of the United States of the Episcopal Church when he talked about the power of love. The power of love can change and transform the world, and we as Christians believe that and live for it. So this vision is deeply rooted in relationships and we have centered around the realities of our neighbors being impacted by broken systems and being impacted by a broken church. In the church, we are now talking about ministry with, ministry with those living in poverty, ministry with those living on the margins, ministry with those wounded by the church, ministry with one another. In eliminating poverty, it is not about fixing people and fixing problems, but it is about living in deep relationship with one another. Ending segregation, eliminating poverty is about relationships and broken systems and how we do this. We roll up our sleeves to do the hard work of living into that vision. We must roll up our sleeves and get out in the world. One of the joys of being at the Board of Church and Society is that the work that we do, that Rebecca does, and that the bishops do, it's really not about serving ourselves, but it is about the church in and with the society. It is outward facing work that John Wesley called us to do. It is not looking at ourselves, it is looking outward to see what is happening in the world that needs to be addressed and how do we engage in those relationships. Some of you may have heard this, it's one of my favorite quotes, but it is from Saint uh, from Pope Francis. He says, let us go forth to offer everyone the life of Jesus Christ. I prefer a church which is bruised, hurting, and dirty because it has been out on the streets rather than a church which is unhealthy from being confined and clinging to its own security. I do not want a church concerned with being at the center which then ends up being caught up in the web of obsessions and procedures. More than the fear of going astray, my hope is that we will be moved by the fear of remaining shut up within structures which give us a false sense of security within rules which make us harsh judges, within habits which make us feel safe. While at our door, people are starving, and Jesus does not tire of saying to us, give them something to eat. We must stand, these are my words, <laughs> we must stand in solidarity with the poor, as Cesar Chavez quoted about the role of the church, he said, it is not buildings or cathedrals. He says, we wanted the church to be present with us, beside us, willing to sacrifice for justice, ready to be Christ among us. We must interrupt systems of violence and oppression and exploitation 
visited with an amazing group of people who were engaged in the world, disrupting these, uh, this violence and oppression. We must disrupt racism. We must eliminate poverty. We must work with immigrants and refugees. We must support sanctuary churches. We must oppose efforts to punish the poor by cutting nutrition assistance and by tripling rent for the poorest households. These are the things that we as the church can and must do. We must help repair the broken systems or building new systems all together, advocating for just policies like you have just done, including also a living wage for industry. Jobs should keep people out of poverty, not keep them in it. We must work for these things which are at our heart. So now we come to the conclusion I invite us to join in our work together. I invite you to go to the website, umcjustice.org, and to look at the things that you can do. On all of these pages, as you click down, there are actions that you can take. There are prayers that you can pray, but there are also actions you can take. Remember the faith and facts cards. What does the Bible say? What does the church say? You turn them over. What are some of the facts and what can you do? Each of these has an opportunity for action. I want to close by telling you a little story <clears throat> that I read in the Irish Times by a man from Connemara after he was arrested for a car accident. He said, there were plenty of onlookers, but no witnesses. For people living in poverty and people living with mental illness and those who are growing older and children without lunches in summer, we can go many places and we can do many things and see very little and not be in any relationships. If we are to become witnesses and to have relationships on our journey of faith, we will cast our eyes very differently. We will have to decide whether to be onlookers or to really witness to the love of Jesus Christ and hear the stories of fellow travelers and pilgrims along the way. We will listen to the suffering and the hopes of fellow strangers and dreamers. And sometimes we will have to hold a lot of pain and sorrow if we are to become witnesses to their lives, if we want to be in ministry with. So in a poem written about Abraham, by a man named Killian McDonald. He was a th theologian and he decided to spend the rest of his life writing poetry. And he has a little poem that he wrote about Abraham and Sarah. And here is what he said. And it is a call to us to go on a journey and to enter into relationships. The call of Abraham. Talk about imperious without a, may I presume, no previous contact, no letter of introduction, this unknown God issues edicts? This is not a conversation. Am I a nobody to receive decrees from one whose name I do not know? I have worshiped my own God to you I have addressed no prayers, but quick like sudden fire I hear from you the words go. At 75, am I supposed to scuttle my life 
and place my arthritic bones upon the road to some mumbled nowhere? Let me get this straight. I will be brief. I summarize. In 10 generations since the flood, you have spoken to no one. Now, like thunder on a clear day, you give commands. Pull up my tent, desert the graves of my ancestors, leave Haran for a country you do not name, there to be a stranger. God of the wilderness from two desiccated lumps from two parched prunes, you promise all the peoples of the earth will be blessed in me? You come late, Lord, very late. But my camels leave in the morning. Susan, thank you. Let's, let's greet Susan again and give thanks for uh, her fine work, her great work that she's doing for the General Board of, the, of Church and Society. Susan, this is a gift. Thank you. Susan, this is a gift, but the real gift today is you. Thank you very much. We're glad that you're here. We're glad you're doing the work. And uh, enjoy. There's, I'll tell you what, in this envelope, let me tell you what's in the envelope. In the envelope, there's a, there's a, a gift certificate to one of my favorite restaurants in Washington, D.C. So um, I, I trust you'll enjoy it and uh, enjoy it with somebody else and have a good time. All right. God bless. Thank you. Take care. Rebecca, it was great to have you. Thanks for the work you're doing on our behalf as well. Rebecca was here in GNJ, helping leading one of our workshops. And so she's already been active in GNJ, and we're grateful for your work and ministry as well. Thank you very much. God bless. God bless.